Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island. The race for Southeast Iowa's Congressional District. Both candidates join us on the cities. For the first time ever, all four candidates running for the two congressional seats that serve the Quad Cities are women. Last week, we featured Illinois 17th Congressional District candidates, Representative Sherry Bustos and Republican Esther Joy King. Well, today, we're featuring the two candidates who are running for the Iowa 2nd District. It's the seat that's been held by Democrat Dave Loebsack since he shocked the political world by defeating Republican Jim Leach back in 2006. Well, Loebsack is now retiring. The election now features Republican State Senator Marionette Miller Meeks, who challenged Loebsack in the past, and former Democratic State Senator Rita Hart, who unsuccessfully ran for lieutenant governor on the Democratic ticket two years ago. We recorded the interview separately using social distancing standards at the Black Box Theater in Moline. And a coin flip determined that we would start with Democrat Rita Hart. Why should someone elect you? How do you win their vote? I talk a lot in this uh, campaign about uh, how I was lucky to be raised in a family where I had a strong Democratic father and a, and a strong Republican mother, and eight brothers and sisters who had a lively caucus around the dinner table every night. It's where I learned how to uh, stand up for what I think, um, understand why, what my positions are, but also it really taught me how important it is to listen to the other side, to understand um, where people are coming from, and for me to understand that good ideas come from everywhere. And so that's the, uh, that's the approach that I like to take um, in talking to people across this district. I'm really happy that we've got support from Democrats, Republicans, and Independents um, in this campaign. I recognize that, um, that we've got to put a campaign behind us once we get elected and do the act of governing, and that means I represent everyone, and that takes listening. Um, to everyone on every side and to um, take good ideas no matter where they come from. We're facing some really big problems here in this country right now with uh, COVID, with, with the economy, with uh, health care, with education. The only way we're going to fix those problems is if we come together um, and do it together. So that's a, that's a message that I want people to understand of my approach and, uh, and, and how we have to come together as a nation to fix these problems. This pandemic looms large in the race as well as across the country and the economy. There's a lot of talk about this $1,200 second uh, stimulus check that people could get. How important is that, do you believe? And how hard would you fight for that if that's what you think the country needs? You know, it's uh, interesting to watch this process in Washington as they come up with this uh, relief package. And it's been disappointing that they haven't gotten it done already. Um, because people are hurting. There's, there's so many people that have lost their jobs through no fault of their own. Um, we cannot uh, um, have a situation where we have more people going into poverty um, because they can't pay their bills, because they don't have a job because of COVID and, and so many other sectors that are really negatively affected. So um, to me, it's, a, it's about targeting that um, relief money to go to the, to the people that really need it that have truly been affected by this uh, pandemic. And so it's clear that some sectors of the economy have been hit harder than others, the unemployed, so that they can continue to pay their bills, so that they don't um, let their rent go, so they don't let their water bills and their electric bills, so that, so that um, they don't get uh, evicted because they can't pay their rent, adding to the homelessness situation. We've got to, do, we've got to get that, relief, that kind of relief to the people that need it. But also we know that the hospitality industry, the retail industry, our small businesses um, continue to um, suffer and uh, we've got to get them the relief they have so we don't lose these businesses forever. Small businesses are so crucial, particularly um, in areas like this district where we have a, a, a lot of small towns that are, that are built on small businesses. And again, our cities and our counties. Um, we don't want them to be laying off police officers and firefighters um, because they're strapped for cash. And That's so, where I was going to go next. How yeah. important is it for, for relief for local government as well as state government? 
so important, right? If, uh, if, uh, if they have to back down on their services and if they have to start laying off uh, police officers, firefighters, um, the people that, that keep, this, you know, keep this, uh, these cities and counties going, um, that's, that's going to affect all of us in a, in a negative way in a big hurry. Record smashing $3.1 trillion was added to the deficit so far this year. That, though, is the other problem, is that you can give the relief, but are we going to pay for it down the road? Well, of course, we have to pay for it, right? Somebody's got to pay for it in the end. Um, it is troubling that the national debt is so high. That was, that was a problem before the pandemic, where um, the national debt was rising at an alarming rate. And so, yeah, when, uh, when after this election is over, um, we've got some huge problems um, that we're going to have to, again, come together to, um, to make sure that we're coming up with the best solutions. And the only way we're going to do that is if, if we start uh, electing people that talk about unity, that talk about bringing people together to, and, to, and are willing to listen uh, to the other side in order to get to those good solutions. We always talk about helping people, of course, and, and making sure that services are funded. What about cuts? I mean, when you're talking about this type of deficit, where do you see targeted cuts needed in the federal level? Well, again, it, there's two sides to the ledger, right? And, um, you know, um, my, I, I've been a farm girl all my life, right? I've, I've, I've uh, done that myself, you know, looking at what can we do to lower the, the costs and what can we do to increase our revenues? That's what it comes down to. So, yeah, we've got as a country, as a um, legislative body, we've got to take a look at how we, how we can improve both sides of that ledger. And so... Um, I think it, it's about priorities. It's recognizing um, what we need to do in order to keep this economy going. Um, but it's also um, to take a really hard look at um, what, where we can uh, make things so that, um, so that they are fairer and in the long run going to help the American taxpayer out. The other area, of course, is health care that you had mentioned is the more critically important now perhaps than ever before. We've seen the dismantling of the uh, ACA. We've seen a more conservative Supreme Court that may dismantle it further. What do you see as far as health care in America that's already been tried with Obamacare that could be improved if you're elected? It is really crucial that we don't go backwards. That's really um, a, a huge problem here. It, it doesn't make any sense to me that we take a system and uh, and and dismantle it and throw millions of people off their, their health care that is working for them, right? Um, so we've got to not go backwards. And then, yeah, we've, there's obvious things that we need to do to lower costs and to make sure that we have accessibility. People are tired of seeing their, their friends, their neighbors um, go broke because they get sick. That's not the kind of America we want to live in. And so um, there are lots of solutions out there. Um, you know, I think that it's worth looking at a Medicare buy-in program. I think a, a public option is something that should be on the table. Um, we also need to take a look at, I think we can find a consensus on both sides of the aisle, and that's probably where we should start, is where we can find common ground, um, knowing that, that people on, on both sides of the aisle are, are interested in allowing Medicare to negotiate for lower drug prices. And um, I think transparency is a big is a big a big part of it. You know, I talk about how my husband had an operation not too long ago and um, didn't understand the billing, and uh, spent hours on the phone, many phone calls to different different uh, entities trying to figure that bill out, to only to discover that we were being charged quite a bit for a piece of equipment we never received. It shouldn't be that hard. Um, and by making it more transparent so that people can understand what the costs are going to be, if they're scheduling a, a, some kind of a, a medical situation, if they can look ahead and see how much that's going to cost and, and, and make sure that they're making good decisions so that so that, um, that will in itself help to bring some of those costs down. One of the biggest nationwide medical issues will be when a vaccine is discovered and actually distributed to Americans. Um, do you have confidence that there will be a vaccine? And the other question is, at least an effective vaccine or whatever comes out first, is that there's going to be a sizable part of the population that will not take it. They will not want it. And that lessens the effectiveness. Do you think there should be some type of a mandate? I think that uh, we can be assured that there's, um, that we have 
a lot of uh, good people that are working um, very hard on this vaccine and are going to do a very thorough job of making sure that that when, when we're ready to distribute it, that it's going to be safe and that it's going to be as effective as possible. I was just listening to Dr. Fauci talk about that um, yesterday. And, and listening to, to experts like Dr. Fauci gives us a, a bit more confidence. And that's what we need. So this is where I think leadership really makes a difference. Um, to make sure that that this is not politicized, that we have the confidence that it isn't politicized, but instead we stand behind these medical people who are working so hard to make such a big difference for all of us. Because in the end, this is what is going to get us back to normal life. And it's so crucial that we get it right. If we don't get this right, our economy will continue to struggle. So it's so important that we get that vaccine out as soon as possible, that people do trust the experts, and that um, and that that people willingly step up and uh, and make sure that uh, we're all protecting each other. You brought up farming, of course. The farm economy is so crucial in this area, and uh, farm bankruptcies are on the rise. Four percent increase in debt, according to the American Farm Bureau, despite forty-six billion dollars in federal farm payments this year. The bailout for farmers can't last forever. Are you worried about the coming year as far as trade with other countries? and as well as uh, uh, the weather and all the other things that, that farmers face. Yeah, farm farmers have really struggled, you know. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, lived my entire life on the farm and, and seen uh, the change as, uh, as, we, we, as we put into place things that helped give farmers more security, you know. When I was a kid growing up, we didn't have crop insurance, and that made a big difference in, in how you approached uh, the risk that you take as a farmer. But risks that have always been there, and that's why it's, uh, it's been disappointing that our trade policy um, has um, been a, lot of, a long time here waiting for it to make a difference for farmers. So, yeah, we've been hit by by the trade, the trade war. We've been hit by the ethanol waivers that um, affected our prices. And then we had um, a, a lot of weather events. We've had drought, we've had too much rain, and we've had a derecho here across the Midwest. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I deal with a, a husband every morning who, who wonders if we should keep on going, right? So these are tough problems for farmers right now. And in the meantime, um, we're also seeing that the taxpayers are having to, uh, to um, help us through this. And so where we'd like to go is to, have, um, to see the kind of leadership that um, is effective in creating um, a better trade relationship um, and additional re um, trade relationships with other countries. So we've got to um, really work hard on that kind of diplomacy to band with other like-minded countries so that we can have a, a, a bit better um, result when it comes to creating a better markets for our farmers. Trump administration got tough with China, as they said earlier in the year, a renegotiated NAFTA with the uh, uh, USMCA. Aren't these better for farmers in the long run? I think that uh, the, the, the proof is here in the pudding. We, we have um, had depressed prices through this entire process. And, and that's not getting made up. Um, we, we should have, instead of going it alone, we should have aligned with our other trade partners in order to have a better fulcrum there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we've got a trade agreement with China. Not clear if they're going to, you know, come through with it. And uh, the one thing that we should be tough on China, we should be tough on China. They are, they are not a good player. We worry about the intellectual theft. But that isn't, haven't, hasn't even been addressed. That's being a, a promise in the second phase. I'm not seeing the results, and I don't think farmers across the country are seeing the results that um, we'd like to see. Our thanks to Democratic congressional candidate Rita Hart. The Republican on the ballot is State Senator Marionette Miller-Meeks. We talked with her moments later at the Black Box Theater. So you have to start with why should someone vote for you? Why are you running? Um, I'm running because given my life history, leaving home at 16, the fourth of eight kids, the only one to have ever even embarked to go to college, working, putting myself through San Antonio Community College, then a degree in nursing, and then finally medical school, and coming to Iowa to do my residency, that history 
should, if nothing else, emphasize to people that um, I really support people being able to achieve their potential. And I never quit. I never quit fighting. I never give up. Uh, that I, I find that uh, a small voice that is persistent can create change and can create dynamics. And I know that if I'm elected to Congress that I will be a huge advocate for Iowans. Uh, I'll continue to fight for the same things I did as a, a state senator, and that's access to affordable, portable health care that gives you choice, uh, skills training and apprenticeships, trade schools that allow people uh, to uh, have a higher skill set, higher paying jobs, and grow the economy, and um, you know, reemphasizing that we need to have trust and accountability in our government institutions. And I really saw that when I was director of public health, and I think that's one of the things that we've lost. I've seen that now when people talk about the vaccine for COVID-19 that I will be the first one to sign up for. I know that the University of Iowa is uh, is a center for that. And so I think that we need to come together, uh, re restore trust in our institutions, have government accountability, uh, and really work hard for the citizens of Iowa and our, for, for our great nation. You talk about restoring trust in our, in our facilities and in our, in our government. Let's talk about the COVID pandemic and the national response. It's been pretty much left state to state to state for a lot of what's going on as far as this pandemic is concerned. Do you think the federal government really has stepped away at a time when it should not have had? I think the federal government did uh, things that the federal government needs to do and that only they can do, like mobilizing uh, businesses and entities to produce ventilators, to produce uh, personal protective equipment, uh, our testing and our reagents. But we are a federalist system, and I think that we know, uh, even in your community in our state, Iowa isn't the same as New York or New York City. And even in Iowa, you know, a tumble where I live isn't the same as necessarily Davenport or Iowa City or other areas. So I think the federalist system where there is some latitude, if you will, for what people actually see on the ground is helpful. But at the same point in time, yes, you know, nationally, what the federal government needs to do, closing borders, mobilizing uh, manufacturers to uh, change their product line and produce something different. And then seeing even our small businesses do that on their own. So for instance, Mississippi Brewing making, um, you know, uh, hand sanitizer or a company like MD Orthopedics or Frog Legs in my town making face shields uh, or making other personal protective equipment to see them step up to the plate. So I think there's this combined Mind both national response and national strategy. And we're going to see that with the vaccine. There has to be a national strategy for how we disseminate and distribute the vaccine and to whom it goes to first. And then also a state response and then even a, a local response, but having also the support of the federal government for that. We've seen a lack of confidence among some politicians in the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as well as the FDA and the way it is uh, responding to this pandemic. Do you think that's justified or, or do you think that is hurting the institutions more than it's helping? Well, I can understand part of it on people who, you know, don't have the same knowledge level of others that are professionals in these areas. When you see changing guidelines, it makes you susceptible uh, to, uh, uh, you know, lacking trust in those institutions. But I think what we've seen uh, of COVID-19, and it bears repeating, and I would like to see elected officials and health officials uh, repeat this, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, the virus, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19, the disease, has been a very resilient virus, and it has not responded in the way typical viruses respond. So the coronavirus that causes the common cold or influenza uh, that causes our seasonal influenza, influenza, they're seasonal, they go away, uh, they affect people, they, you know, they do mutate, and so you have to have a different vaccination for influenza every year, but yet they still respond in a certain way. And SARS-CoV-2 has not done that. It has not proven to be seasonal. It has mutated. It has changed which organ systems. So again, remember when we started the uh, pandemic, primarily we thought it was respiratory, and then we found that uh, it was neurological, affecting smell and headaches, and even some people developing uh, an encephalitis or meningitis-like disease. Then it was gastrointestinal, and now there's uh, vascular or blood clotting abnormalities. So it's changed the organ systems, it's changed how it affects those, and then also how it affects the immune system. So it has proven to be a strange virus, uh, very weird, not typical for viruses, and as such, 
we've had to adapt and change our messages. So I think um, one of the things I'm very uh, staunch advocate for is for transparency. So I think had the CDC and the FDA initially came out with masks can be helpful, uh, they're uh, more important to help protect other individuals, but we don't want to run on N95 masks that were needed for healthcare facilities. You know, uh, you can do these things in lieu of that as we ramp up production. I think those kind of things would have been very helpful to be very transparent in what the thought process was, what the necessity was, what the benefit was, and there'd be less uncertainty now as we, uh, as we come through this. Getting a vaccine rapidly doesn't mean the vaccine is not going to be ineffective and it's not going to be safe. It still has to go through all the same regulatory hurdles. It's just that some of them are doing, being done at the same time. And we also have some experience with SARS-CoV-2 because the University of Pittsburgh was already looking at the original SARS. So they had some information and data and experience with uh, dealing with this type of virus. So I think that should give uh, people some comfort and security uh, in that. Number one, know that the virus is changing. So um, how we talk about the virus and recommendations may change also. Uh, that we're, but for all of our institutions to be more transparent with their data, with their information, with the rationale and the thought process, I think would help all of us to be more secure and feel more comfort uh, that the information we're getting is both up to date, state of the art, and is reliable. Well, COVID-19 not only has a huge health impact, as you know, it has an economic impact as well. They've been struggling with coming up with another relief package, perhaps $1,200 per person. Also question of whether or not you should help out some local governments, even state governments. Where do you stand on both of those things as far as a relief package is concerned for individuals, as well as relief for government? Yeah, I think that the relief package that was um, originally passed was necessary, and I think another relief package uh, uh, is in order. And, you know, you've heard the refrain, this is life versus the economy. To me, this is life versus life. As a state senator, I had to help individuals to navigate through stimulus checks, unemployment. Um, I've had companies approach me. Um, that they were about to lose their business and how to help them to stay in business, how to help them navigate PPP. Um, I've uh, known farmers who have committed suicide when they had to euthanize their herds. Uh, we know that child abuse is up, but when kids aren't in school, the, um, one of our biggest sources of mandatory reporters is, is not seeing children. Uh, addiction, drug overdoses, uh, depression. And depression, chronic depression, can lead to long-term health problems and uh, a life expectancy that's much shorter. So this is life versus life. All of us are making sacrifices. All of us have suffered through this, whether we know someone that's had COVID-19 or who has died, you know, even if they have other pre-existing medical conditions have died with COVID-19. Uh, it is a serious illness. It has tremendous ramifications to us, both for our health and for the health of our economy. And, and a package that helps individuals, helps small businesses, I think is very important. How much help it gives to states, I, I think, you know, do you think we, uh, here in Iowa, we in Iowa, we've had uh, a very, um, uh, fiscally conservative budget. We saved money. We uh, put money back into our emergency funds. We have a state law that requires us to spend no more than 99% of our revenues. And because of that, we have uh, weathered the pandemic in a good fashion and the uh, subsequent uh, derecho uh, storm as well because we had those conservative um, fiscal uh, uh, policies. And so should we ask the taxpayers of Iowa, and an essential worker, someone who has to go to work every day, who may, may make minimum wage or, let, or you know, above minimum wage, to ha pay taxes to support and bail out a state such as Illinois or California or New York, who um, you know, have uh, you know, uh, very expansive spending packages. So I do struggle with that. Uh, there is some help, I think, that needs to go. But as far as the federal government dictating election laws, um, I'm not in support of that. And I am not for asking an essential worker, minimum wage worker in Iowa, to pay taxes to bail out states who have a spending problem and who have a longstanding spending problem, not just because of the pandemic. What about to bail out farmers? We're seeing uh, uh, farm bankruptcies on the rise right now. Um, markets were closed during uh, trade discussions. Um, a, a huge bailout already occurred and farmers are still struggling. 
Yeah, you know, farmers are struggling, as uh, have uh, some manufacturers, as have individuals in the hospitality sector, such as uh, you know uh, our restaurant, our airline, our uh, hotel motel, uh, and that also serves as a as a source for tax revenue for cities and states. And so I think one of the things the president has said very well is that businesses were closed down and have you know can be close to bankruptcy not because they themselves had a poor business model but because we imposed a shutdown on them to try to save as many people as possible uh, and until we learned more about the virus to learn how to keep people safe while we safely and soundly reopen our economy. So I think it was appropriate. Uh, farmers have been especially hit because we had the tariffs as we navigate through uh, a phase, uh, phase one trade agreement with China. Uh, and we're uh, going through that process and I think it will accelerate after the election. Uh, and then of course their markets were closed uh, with the pandemic and if you were a livestock producer, uh, uh, processing plants were closed. And, and that's where I said I've known of, of farmers who have committed suicide because they had to euthanize their herds. So I think that was appropriate. But one of the things farmers have told me repeatedly is that when it came to the tariffs and the trade agreements, that they felt that that was short-term pain for long-term gain. For over a decade, they've told me something needed to be done about China and its egregious trade practices. So how we hold China or the Chinese Communist Party accountable uh, for COVID-19, I think you do that through um, international organizations with uh, international partners. Both sides, political campaigns. Um, you say your Democratic opponent is too linked to the Democratic Party. You, of course, have a Republican. Where would you diverge to represent eastern Iowa, perhaps at the expense of supporting Republican policy? Well, um, in the state Senate, I was the chair of human services. And uh, so as the chair, I put forth bills. Didn't matter if they were Republican bills, Democrat bills, but if they ma made good health policy sense, I put them forward. And, and sometimes in doing that, you actually bring your party along with you. And so uh, we passed a bill uh, to have oral contraceptives for over age 18 uh, over the counter or behind the counter. Uh, I passed legislation to get uh, a waiver uh, from the five-year eligibility waiting period for lawful permanent residents who are pregnant to get access to prenatal care. We passed bills on non-medical switching of your prescription medications and what that means is it uh, to prevent the insurance company from switching your prescription medication to a, a lower priced or cheaper prescription medication just on the basis of the cost without that change being initiated by your physician or your provider uh, so passing legislation such as that uh, they weren't necessarily Republican ideas they weren't some of them were Democrat ideas some Republican ideas some uh, you know, no one knew about, but we passed them in and put them forward. And to be able to bring people to consensus, to compromise, and remember that you're there to serve. I've been able to do that through my time as both a nurse, as a physician, as a director of public health, and even in the military in the 24 years I uh, spent in the military. And I think if you remember to treat people with respect and dignity, so I follow the golden rule. It sounds kind of kindergartenish. But if you treat people with respect and dignity, uh, and dignity uh, you interact with them, remembering uh, I don't question people's motivations, um, that uh, if uh, we're there to serve, we're there to do what's best for Iowans. And if we remember that, and that's our guiding principle, then I think that we're going to be guided to do things in the proper and the right way, and we'll keep fighting for Iowans and then for our great country. Marionette Miller-Meeks, the Republican candidate for the Iowa 2nd Congressional District. Early voting has already begun in Iowa and Illinois. Absentee ballots have been mailed to those who have requested them. There are also early voting centers opening up throughout the area to ease on congestion on Election Day. You can go to the county clerk's office as well in Illinois or the county auditor's office in Iowa to get more information and to vote early. Simply put, Get out and vote. On the air, on the radio, on the web, on your mobile device, and now streaming on your computer. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. Wheelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory, a proud supporter of WQPT, has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Now providing live stream capabilities for viewing your loved one's funeral or memorial service at their chapel in Rock Island. 